Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first Friday, um, first Friday e-call with K-State Research and Extension. Our purpose for this call, as always, is to increase the number of people, the, to increase the local community's knowledge of the experts, the education, and the economic resources that are available to help make their small business and the communities who love them successful. Um, as always, the call is being recorded. And you will get a link to the website when it's posted and a copy of the presentation deck. Um, we're a research organization. The university loves to know whether this matters to you um, because you are the people we're trying to serve. And so if, it, if we're not doing it well, we wanna know that. At the end of the call, you'll have a very brief questionnaire, two true and false questions, or two very short questions. Did you learn something today that you can use immediately, yes or no? And how many people will you forward this information to? That implies that I'm asking you to think during the, the course of this, who else would like to know this? And then finally, if you're willing to share, what did you learn today that was most helpful to you? And we'll share all of those results with our speakers. Having said that, um, let me introduce today's speaker. Over the past year, the Office of Rural Prosperity and the Patterson Family Foundation partnered to create 12 rural champions. Today, Carrie Paletti will interest, introduce us to three rural champions who will share their experiences and lessons learned about housing. Carrie, thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay, let me do share screen. Okay, so Tricia Purden is our ORP director. She was to be on today, but she is under the weather, so she apologizes, but sends out um, her good mornings to everybody as well. Um, so as Nancy mentioned, the Office of Rural Prosperity had our Rule by Choice Champions program, and we had 12 champions across the state. Um, so this kind of just shows where we were really trying to get a broad coverage of the state. So housing, child care, mental health, um, entrepreneurship, and trails were some of the primary projects we had. So um, today we are going to be hearing from our three housing champions. So we'll have Cheryl Edelhart. She uh, was working um, pretty much countywide, but concentrating in Anthony Harper. We'll have Darcy Wilson from Lynn County, as well as Lissa Sexton up in Wallace County. Um, each will go through their projects and kind of talk about their communities, how they were all different, and um, what different um, tactics they took in their communities. So with that brief intro, I know we have a lot of info to cover, so um, then we'll take questions towards the end. So make sure you jot down questions for each as uh, they're going through their presentations on their projects. So we will start with Cheryl and talk about your project there in Harper County. Okay, good morning. Um, our project, we did a countywide effort, but um, we were kind of unique in that we concentrated on all the cities and the county separately, and then they worked together, which was an awesome endeavor in putting statistics together, but also um, educating everyone as to what everyone else was doing. Um, that just doesn't generally happen. So um, the main focus of our project was to, of course, complete the housing assessment tool. Our communities didn't have um, staff that had time to do this, which is pretty much normal for rural areas. Um, by doing that, we increased the job load, but the results were certainly worth it. Um, we had a uh, large housing committee. We had one joint committee, we called it, and then we had in the joint committee, there was an individual committee for each town. And what this did, of course, was um, get information and uh, let everybody know that we did have a housing problem. We've been saying that for years, like everybody else, but what was the problem? So the HAT um, 
allowed us to focus and determine what was the problem or to prioritize problems. And then of course, not just identify them, but to set some goals and determine, you know, what was feasible to move ahead. Um, again, doing it with each city, we'll go back to Harper County first. There's 5,600 and some people. So we're fairly small. We are Southwest of Wichita. So we are in their Metro area. We're right on the border. Um, so all of those things come into play with the information that we um, identified as being important to our decisions. Um, so in doing this, we wanted to be sure that our committees were very diverse. And so the partners that we involved, um, I wanna step back just one step here. When you're doing the hat, the site on um, the Department of Commerce um, is awesome. There are so many resources. And one of the things I wish I would have done at the beginning is focused a little bit more on the resources and not on just getting the statistics. So be sure to identify your resources and the state is so helpful. Those of us been around a long time, that wasn't always the case. So kudos to the state staff now. Anyhow, we in each town then, um, we have Anthony and Harper and Attica, um, Anthony and Harper second class, Attica's third class because of their size. Um, so we knew we were gonna find different problems and of course, different solutions. One of the partners that was important to us was the larger employers in each community because again, that's where a lot of your need comes from, is your employers trying to hire, to recruit, to retain. And if there's no housing available, that becomes a problem for them. Um, we also involved, there are two school districts in our county. We involved both of them. We talked with all the city um, entities and visited with the county board of commissioners. We had people from different financial institutions several different community service groups so that we could address, you know, the aging or other other needs that we identified in our communities. And um, I'll bring up a point later that really, really listen to people because you don't always know what those groups are that need to be involved with your project. Um, so as we got into our statistics, and we've got a lot of that from census numbers, we got some of it from local information. And um, the one thing that happened was each town had the same problems, yet they were unique in their own way. And as you identify that, it also becomes apparent that each community supports the other community. One of the first things that started happening at our joint committees were, oh, well, we don't care if you get a, a new house in your town because that's going to benefit us too. So that strategy of working together also makes them more cohesive and the collaboration just lets all other projects grow also. So um, one of the things that we did, um, oh, go back one, Carrie, oh, please. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I wanted to talk about um, some of the things that we did um, determining the housing deals. Um, we did, oh, as required by the HAT process, you have to do a community engagement. And of course, doing that, be, be open-minded when you go into it, because you're gonna learn something you didn't know, I promise. Um, my joint committee had a choice of doing a community sur survey or a town hall meeting, and they chose to do both. Well because we had three cities, that was a lot of extra work and putting things together, but it was so worthwhile to commit that time. And um, when we did the community surveys, because Harper has a um, industry that is very Hispanic oriented, we did the community surveys in both Spanish and English. The people that I worked with on that were a lot more technology users than I was. And so we were able to do that with a QR code. Oh, just made everything so easy. And at the end of the day, everything was already um, 
tabulated for you. You didn't have to go in and try and figure out what, who said what. And that also allowed for tabulation of anything that was written to uh, questions as opposed to just multi-choice. That was really helpful. On the town hall meetings, of course, then we had to have three instead of just one. But we let the communities know that if they miss theirs, they could go to another one and, and still be able to access the, all the information and participate and have input. So that was that was kind of a nice um, end result there. The business surveys were amazing. It's recommended that you talk to the five top businesses, largest business as in your communities. Um, of course, in our small communities, we didn't have five large businesses. But um, in doing all of that, the communities were able to identify that they each had their own strength also. You know, we're not always talking about things we're lacking or our weaknesses, but we need to focus on strengths to help address the, the other. Um, one, of the, one of the cities was identified as being very uh, manufacturer oriented. Another city was more retail and egg based. And then the smaller city was, um, had a chance at a couple of real unique manufacturing issues that were hindered of course, by not having housing. So it was good for everyone to see that we all had the same problems, even if they were a little bit unique to each other. So um, the businesses, what was astounding, the businesses all had plans to expand. But the housing and childcare were very detrimental to the uh, hiring and retention of their employees. So, um, you know, it made the businesses aware, too, that housing is they need to be a partner in addressing the housing needs. So, OK, Carrie, go on. I'm good. OK, um, one of the unexpected results from this process was that not only our committee of 27 people, but also the community were able to see the hard facts, the statistics, the demographics. They'd never seen that before. So everyone was very um, open to learning and sharing that information and using it for not just addressing housing needs, but in growing their stability in that community. So, you know, we hadn't looked at that as part of the process, but information always exaggerates the, the goals that can be set. So um, with all of those needs, of course, the education part of it did stand out to people. They wanted to have someone talk to them on a grassroots level to say, oh, we can help you do this, or we can't do that because of this. Um, so they kind of identified that they would like to see a uh, community housing specialist position. You know, positions aren't going to happen because of budgeting and taxes and such, but if people felt that was a great need and they did, and they identified it to their um, governmental agencies, um, it, it became a little bit more important, at least a point of conversation. Um, that person could be, as one person said at a meeting, we need someone to hold our people's hands. In the rural area, we don't have access to have agencies to look out for you or that you can call and ask the questions. You don't know who to call. So a specialist could be the person that tells the elderly that, you know, they might have a chance at some weatherization if um, that's the need for them. And we had people at the town hall that said, oh, I don't want someone coming in my house or I don't want to do anything like that, only because they were afraid. They were afraid to deal with other people about things that they'd done all their life themselves or had their spouse take care of for them. So um, having that kind of a person in our community isn't what's going to build a new house or a new development, but it's going to help keep some of our people possibly in a more quality of life residence. 
So that community housing specialist position was a surprise. We didn't know that something like that could come out of all that information. The other thing that um, the communities, town halls and, and the committees learned was all the different resources that are out there. Land banks had never been a term that anybody in our county knew about. So we learned about land banks and what great resources that could be for our community. We learned about uh, a lot of the state resources. Again, once you complete your hat, you visit them with the state agency, the housing, KHRC, and they kind of help you determine what some of those uh, programs would help your situation. So getting the housing assessment tool completed was the number one goal of our process. And it has been enlightening. It has also made us eligible for a lot of housing funds that otherwise could not be um, requested. So we were very happy to get that done. Um, the many grant incentives that we've talked about there, again, in a rural community, you don't have, we don't even have people. If you get on a list to get something fixed at your house, you're talking a year, year and a half because builders can't afford to drive to the rural community. So um, we identified all of those problems that we had in, I think all of us and, and some other counties before us, you know, you don't ever reinvent the wheel. You share and you expect other people to share back. So the mini grant incentives was a way to offer smaller projects, not big development projects, because that may or may not happen in rural counties, but the mini grants would help the locals to be able to rehab, maybe even demo. Again, look at all your resources and figure out which ones you can use and be sure and contact your other communities that have had like problems or have already done something. Don't don't spend a lot of time spinning wheels. Contact them and say what worked, what didn't. So again, a little networking, a little becoming more informed, all of those helped us tremendously. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much, Cheryl. And kind of a uh, for the housing assessment tool, the champions were uh, part of the pilot on the new hat that Commerce has rolled out. So the experiment of working on these on a countywide basis. So uh, a couple of different ways to show that it can be done. So they were another pilot as we went through all of this. So now we'll hear from Darcy and how you guys carried out your project there in Lynn County. So um, we started with, um, well, hello everyone, first of all. Um, I'm Darcy Wilson and we started with, um, we did a neighborhood revitalization um, plan, uh, which is basically a tax rebate program um, that's continuing on. That'll actually go on for the next five years. And um, that's going pretty well. Um, that's also for um, residential and commercial uh, new con new construction and rehabilitation. Um, we did the state's updated process for the um, housing assessment tool. And um, that has really given us a good foundation as to where to start. Um, like. Cheryl as well, we uh, formed a housing committee. We involved the community, major businesses um, throughout the county. And, um, you know, getting the community involved is, is key. That really helped us as well. Uh, we, I, Lynn County itself is less than 10,000 people. Um, however, the county is huge. It's 600 square miles. So it's a lot bigger than, um, it's a lot of agricultural, but it's also, it's a little unique. It's seven cities, but it has no center. Um, so we did our um, housing assessment countywide um, because we have no center uh, city basically. So it was, we didn't do it city by city. 
So we were a little unique in that aspect. So it was a little more difficult doing it that way, but um, we got it done. And um, it helped us really decide where we needed to start and what areas um, needed focus first. With that being said, it was very eye-opening. Um, you know, when you just look at the numbers of vacancy compared to why they're vacant was, um, you know, you can just look at numbers thinking, oh, well, there's places to live in the county. Well, that's not necessarily true because it shows 22% vacancy. Those vacancies aren't vacant because they're available housing, they're dilapidated, which is a huge difference when they're not livable, um, when a huge percentage needs to be torn down um, or, you know, they need to be rehabilitated. So that's that was a big eye opener, you know, when one town needs complete, you know, needs more demolished and other towns need more rehabilitation. So that was huge where we needed, you know, different housing incentives for different areas. So that was uh, that was very positive uh, results from that hat on what we needed to do with each city. Um, and, you know, getting the major cities or getting the major businesses involved, the community involved, um, and that housing community was really good. So you can switch Terry if you need to. <laughs> um, the surprises, you know, like I said, was the dilapidated houses, um, the number of those, and um, the positive surprise was the um, involvement from a few of the cities, you know, the cities that want to be involved, they worked well together. Um, so that was a positive. The community, um, the community response from the uh, surveys that we put out was huge. We got a lot more responses than we ever thought we would get, um, which was very positive. You know, people were talking about what the county needed and as far as housing goes, but, you know, either people don't know how to start or where to start and to actually see the county starting was a positive thing. So that was really bringing people together to to engage in that survey and to be willing to talk to you about what they wanted and where they wanted it and what they needed. So that was that was good. Um, so so the outcomes you developed. So you know, like I said, that the neighborhood revitalization program, the hat gave us a good foundation. Um, we are hoping to apply for the MIH in the third round. Being in a rural area, um, being rural, you really struggle for developers. Um, you try to keep everything in your county. You try to keep the developer in your county. You try to keep purchases in your county. You try to keep as much in your county as you possibly can because you want all the income to stay in your county. And right when you think you have everything there, the carpet gets pulled out from under you, and we use that word that we all love so much, as Cheryl said, pivot. And so we pivot a lot, and we were having to pivot again with the MIH, and we're trying, we were talking to another developer here, and so hopefully this one will work out. It's, housing can be very frustrating in the developer world because you have to have a reputable developer and you have to have, you know, you have to have a lot of commitment with housing. And so that is probably the biggest frustration when it comes to housing in a rural area. Finding someone that will drive this far, material cost, and all the things that go with it. The state's great about here's the money, but to get somebody to come out here and do it with the money is a whole other ball game. So we're working on it and I'm not giving up. So we'll see what we can come up with. And then we've come up with some housing incentives and we're gonna keep moving forward with those. Um, 
Lissa, sorry, I'm not stealing Lissa's stuff, but I did. Um, we borrow those in this um, empty nester, the long-term vacancy and the Paint Lane County program. Um, so we have some housing incentives and then we have some other projects that we're hoping to file for and grants to file for to beautify the county. So that's okay. what I've got. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and definitely pivoting is something that we have all learned a lot through these projects. And I think that's kind of where the, the world champion has come into play on these projects is because pivoting takes new learning and having this person to do this learning so that these projects can keep going and pivoting um, is definitely a lesson learned. So uh, thank you, Darcy, for your information. And then so we'll have... Yes. Oh, sorry, Jason just brought that. In. Yes, Jason, oh, I, I'm I'm in it now. I I am in it now. Thank you. Okay, the floor is yours. Okay, it's mine. All right, so um, I'm Lissa Sexton um, in Wallace County. So Wallace County is um, on the Colorado border. Um, we're the second least populated county in the state. Um, and just to kind of give you some perspective, so Wallace County, um, for about 15 years has not had any form of organized community development. And so my goal coming into the Rural Champions Project was just, there was no guarantee of funding beyond the Rural Champions. And so this idea of what can I legitimately get accomplished within a year's time and so i started it and you know you start with the conversations of land banks and um neighborhood revitalization plans or maybe a um, rural housing incentive district right and point blank those conversations um are oftentimes hard in rural communities um where Maybe you're talking about tax abatement and you're in a small community and a lot of your um, annual budget comes from property taxes. And so those conversations, you know, they just weren't where our community was. Um, again, that's where I thought the starting point was. And um, so I think that's kind of one of the coming full circle of finishing this real champion year was you really have to start where your community is ready to start. And so um, we started, you know, kind of initially, I tried to introduce some of those, you know, bigger, broader concepts of um, what we could do for housing. And they weren't, they just weren't sticking. Um, they were just a little too complex for what Wallace County was ready to have um, at that time where we just haven't had community or economic development, um, you know, at, at any level of formal capacity. So this is where, you know, just kind of go back and brainstorm. And um, it ended up kind of being consecutively happening. Um, these housing incentives um, along with the HAP process. So going through this HAP process and, um, and, and it was a great resource. Again, it's a lot of data to go through, but again, when you're in a small town or a small community, Wallace County's 1,500 people as a whole county. Um, we did the hat as a county um, purely because there were not good enough statistics for communities that have eight, uh, 80 people. You know, you just, your stats are not there. So we did the countywide hat. Um, and it's, when you're in a small community, a lot of times you can point out, you know, specific houses or, you know, uh, very specific elements, but it's hard to have kind of a broader um, data view of things. So it's a lot of data to go through the hat, but it's a very, you sit down and you do it and you have stats at the end. And so it was very helpful um, in conversations to, to complete that hat. Um, we had our county commissioners involved. We had just our local housing advisory committee involved um, and tried to be inclusive of each community and the business and uh, the businesses, the schools as one of the larger employers. Um, and then kind of consecutively at the same time, you know, because I'm on a timeline, 
Um, I'm thinking, you know, I've got 12 months, what can I accomplish? And so um, I started applying um, and, you know, Darcy said she copied B, but point blank, I didn't, I didn't create this wheel of these, um, you know, just boots on the ground, you know, what can you do at a local level with m local funding? You know, I don't have to wait for, you know, an annual grant to open up. I don't have to, you know, um, thankfully we have, um, our local community foundation and the Dangy Hansen Foundation in Northwest Kansas. And so there are my local funders. I can apply to them on a monthly basis. And so I started applying, organizing and applying um, this four part uh, housing incentive program. So um, again, I don't wanna repeat what uh, Darcy did, but essentially we have the demo assistance, which I don't believe Darcy said she had, and then these empty nester downsizer long-term vacancy, and then paint Wallace County. And so we've had these um, open since I think April, um, and we actually completed the hat in May, technically. So, you know, there's the timing of it, it's, you know, but we were able to see those stats and that was when I was able to organize funding. And like I said, it's, I'm trying to accomplish whatever I can in one year and do it with local, re as local resources as possible. Um, and so, some of the the stats, um, you know, these these uh, incentives were um, were based on some of those data points. So, um, and Darcy talked about her vacancy rate. Um, and so, in Wallace County, it's kind of interesting. We've got about eighteen percent vacancy, but we have um, about only uh, five percent that's quote unlivable. Uh, and so, this this idea of Sometimes these housing data points bring up conversations that are a little uncomfortable to talk about. You know, um, are we are we being open and accessible as a community? You know, if we have, you know, or, or what are the reasons? What are the personal reasons that uh, maybe we have vacancies in rural communities? Um, and some of it might be that they're dilapidated, like Darcy said. But you know, according to the stats and what you know, I can see on the ground, you know, um, maybe that's not all of it, you know, maybe it's sometimes just convenient. Maybe it's uh, to have a second home and, it, you know, set vacant besides one weekend of a year or something when family comes back. Um, uh, and I also think it does uh, talk to or, you know, speak to this idea of our openness of rural communities and um, factors that limit our growth. So those are hard conversations to have. Um, and uh, at any time, um, but when you go in with some of those data points, it is it kind of changes the conversation of oh okay I can kind of see maybe that perspective and maybe we need to maybe we need to be more open and accessible in our rural communities. Um, and then another one this um, uh, empty nester downsizing and this was you know um, according to our stats in Wallace County we have. Um, about 75% of our homes are one or two percent households. Um, and I think it's about 4% maybe are one bedroom households or one bedroom housing or housing only has 4% that is one bedroom. And so this idea of when we're going after what we need to build, what we need to invest in, this idea of if people, even if people wanted to downsize in Wallace County, they maybe couldn't because there's not actually a smaller home that's available, um, that's less maintenance. And so that that gives some insight for me to be able to communicate with local people who, um, who are interested in building. And um, there is one local man that, um, a business owner that is, is currently building two um, small homes uh, to rent or sell, and he was on my housing committee. And so this idea of that uh, that data drove him to go ahead and make that decision uh, to invest in um, those those small builds. Um, sorry, I'm going to move my computer. I was in the sun there. Um, and then, like I said, just to um, acknowledge the funding partners for those incentives, we've got uh, Dane G. Hansen, uh, our local Wallace County Community Foundation, and then our uh, county commissioners also contributed some funds to those um, housing incentives. Um, so some of them based on data, uh, but just to 
point blank also your uh, the paint the county one, which is uh, essentially $500. Anybody can get to repaint their personal home or a rental property. Um, $500, no match to it. That is that has been the most popular one um, to use or to use in the last you know six months or so that we've had them open, um, and and it's it's a lot I think about just people being it's it's a simple decision we have to decide what color to paint our house we don't have to make hard decisions um, like moving grandma out of her you know her lifetime home I know that's a hard decision and. Um, and so the paint the county has been the the most popular one. Um, trying to make sure I got to all of my notes here. Um, and then just kind of again, housing was one thing that Wallace County was working on. Um, broadly, it was one of about three things in addition to just trying to create just a structure that could live past um, this rural champion one year funding. Um, and so, housing was one of those things we were working on and um but we all know that housing is connected to employment and it's all connected to child care and it's you know it's all connected to the aesthetics of your main street um and so uh, just the other things that we've been working on in wallace county as far as outcomes that have come out of the championship program or champion program is um, the storefront and signage incentive uh which uh Essentially, if you're a business and you want to make improvements to the exterior of your home um, or exterior of your of your business, then there's funding to help incentivize and help you work through that twenty five hundred dollars. Um, and then we are just rolling out these workforce uh, recruitment incentives um, uh, with funding provided by the Northwest Kansas Economic and Innovation Center. Um, and so. Um, like I said, lots of great funding locally um, and just really appreciate the Office of Rural Prosperity's opportunity to uh, move all of these projects forward with the Real Champion funding because that's that's been a key component as well. So I cover it all, Carrie. I think you did great. Mm -hmm. You did a very good job. Um, and I okay, let me check chat here real quick. So we've got some time for some questions. Then let me see um, yes. if there's any questions to hit before we move. I haven't seen any, Carrie. Um, oh, Jason sorry. pointed out that the Department of Commerce hosts a housing resources developer profile, and that should be very helpful. I've heard that before, Darcy. I know you tried to keep it in county, but other speakers have said, nope, we had to commit to somebody from other places because yep. we just had to have them. I I understand. I think we're going to hit that list for sure. And I just put in the link uh, on the Commerce website where the housing resources page is. Um, Felicia, how do we approach this issue to our local housing authority? Alicia, it sounds like you might be in an urban area, maybe, that you have a local housing authority, yes. Uh -huh. And I guess if it's referencing how you take the approach of like doing a housing assessment or um, the incentive programs, I think it kind of depends on where you're at in your community on the discussion of housing. And if there's a good, strong partnership with your housing authority, yes, both. Okay, because the housing assessment, it, it's something that really gives you that data. So I guess uh, we'll open that to Cheryl Darcy or Alyssa, if anybody kind of has, um, if you had a housing authority before the project, were you able to bring them to the table or was that a situation that any of you had prior to? We, well, we had to, we formed a housing committee and then that's part of the actual housing assessment is to form a housing committee. That's one of the steps in the housing mm -hmm. assessment is to form the housing committee. You actually need a committee to complete it. Um, so did once any you of have that, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, did either of the three have a housing authority through any of the communities or the county prior to, or was that something you all established? Basically, your 
commute your uh, committee through the hat. Because I'm not sure a lot of rural communities have housing authorities. So, and I, again, I'm not, you know, this novice on all of it. So hopefully I'm not speaking out of term, but uh, Sharon Springs has a housing authority uh, for some subsidized, they've got um, 12 or 13 apartments, I believe, that are uh, subsidized housing. Um, and there is a, a housing author authority board for that, um, for those specific units. Um, but as far as, um, you know, anything broader than that, I don't believe that Wallace County does. Yeah, Liz, Liz Heron, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Cause... Yeah, I will just say something quick. My name is Liz Heron, and I'm also working um, with Commerce. Local housing authorities typically are in urban areas because they're working with subsidized affordable housing. So they should be a partner in doing any sort of assessment. Um, but typically, they're not overseeing like a comprehensive housing strategy for the whole community. So it really should be kind of led by the city with the local housing authority being a partner in that. Um, but they should be wanting to be involved in those conversations too, um, to, because they're also addressing kind of those issues in a community in regards to housing. So hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> yes, that's very helpful. Thank you, Liz. And uh, um, obviously we've talked a lot about the housing assessment uh, tool that Commerce has. And, and Liz is the uh, specialist that oversees that program. So she is a great person to get to know because um, that is definitely a good, a good tool that has definitely been improved. So now you know Liz as well. So thank you. Okay. I think, I think that's one of the huge takeaways I hear from all of you is the data and and understanding the actual situations and opening up the conversations about why it's vacant or that it that it is unlivable. I, I think that's a tremendous takeaway. Well, and I think a lot of this um the base data also starts from the the statewide housing assessment that KHRC and ORP did um here. A couple of years ago, I mean, that really started a lot of conversations and started identifying where things should be uh, emphasis at. And I think that was one of those that came to the top that it needs to be something doable that any community. And that's why, you know, with our champions that are unique in their own ways. But if you've got, you know, your county that has to do, if you have 1500 people on a county wide, generally it was really for cities. So having that experience to be able to see how it can be done in all of our rural communities. Um, and there was a quick question on if rural champions will be um, offered again, and the hope is yes. Um, if you don't get our newsletter, sign up for our newsletter, kansascommerce.com slash ORP, or just drop me an email, um, and we'll make that announcement. We're waiting to find out if funding has been confirmed for another year of that. Um, so for those that aren't familiar with champions, that program provides a stipend to a city, county, or nonprofit organization for um, 20 hours a week of a, would otherwise be a volunteer in your community to then receive that stipend to really dedicate to a particular program that's identified as a need in the community. So, um, and you can see a lot more information on our website than, um, Hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll do it again, which would be another 12 communities across the state. So, okay. Oh, thank you, Jason, for putting the housing assessment link in there as well. So we have a few more questions. So we'll kind of just go through each of the champions to have an opportunity to kind of dig a little deeper into some of the learning that has been done through the champion program. Um, how has addressing adequate affordable housing positively impacted your work? Let's affordable and adequate is a, a very big conversation. So if we want to start with Cheryl and then we'll go through and then we can. Okay, that's a pretty large question. Addressing it sounds to me like you're wanting to fix it. Well, we all know housing is such a long-term process that um, our work was identifying possible resources, possible goals, um, 
again, we couldn't have done any of it without the information from the hat. But by having that information, you could go to your entities, you could go to your businesses and share that with them so that um, to be able to move forward with any of your goals, you have to involve all of the above and your state resources. So addressing um, the problem is such a long-term, long-term process that uh, you don't, your, your work's impacted by the pro, the, the goal that you've identified first, but then there's always a goal after that and after that. So I would say that um, as far as impacting what we've done in our year, it's just the beginning. <laughs> mm -hmm. Darcy, Lisa, anything to add to that? Um, he, I mean, Cheryl pretty much hit everything. I would just say, you know, the the, pos the positive side of that is just seeing the potential to fill those empty positions at these major businesses. You know, now seeing what we need as far as housing and knowing that there's a potential to fill the open teacher positions and the open nursing positions in our three clinics, medical clinics that we have here and the open positions here in the county and the open positions in the uh, larger corporations, you know, here. So people don't have to commute 60 miles one way. It would, that's encouraging. So I think that was a, a positive impact to bringing, you know, that we can see that, you know, addressing this affordable housing, you know, issue is, is you know, good. I think just the first question just being, you know, um, how did it affect, you know, just, just addressing it, just having the conversation is, is a mm -hmm. great thing right and so just putting the right people or people who you think might take action in your housing advisory committee you know can make all the difference because you're sitting there talking about it and then they can see the data they can have the conversations with other people who might be willing to invest locally um and i said we uh, are seeing some of that, you know, the the person who is building was in my housing committee and got to see that data and have the conversations about what might be affordable, what we might actually need. Um, and so just having those conversations um, has, you know, is, is moving the needle. Mm -hmm. so, so we're running, running towards the end of time. So kind of now that you've been through this, so these projects started October, so this is the ending of the 12 months. So maybe one of that 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 nugget of information, the best practices uh, that you would recommend for any community or county that is wanting to take something on. And Lisa does have a different perspective because she, at the same time, was trying to establish a community development program. So kind of, you know, with that piece in there, it kind of came to the top. But where, what's kind of that one thing, your takeaway that you would want to share with anybody on this call that, that might be thinking about taking on addressing housing? I think that most... With, oh. Well, we all okay. started at the same time. <laughs> Go ahead, Lisa. I was... Go ahead. Darcy. If you start with a rural champion, make sure you can, Jessica, if you're listening, don't take this the wrong way. Make sure that you can keep that champion or to have somebody in place to continue on. Because if, if, they, if you put somebody in this place and they do the hat and they see the need for this position, let's make sure you have somebody in place to continue this, continue the work, even if it's not that same person. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because if that person isn't going to be able to finish what they started, housing takes forever. The, the hat is finished. Even if we are awarded the MIH, the, the job is now finished. You know, we've been awarded till April. 
that's now the houses are going to be built or, you know, make sure that it's, it, there's time allowed allotted for that person to do the work mm -hmm. and be patient, ask questions, be patient and put the work in because it is rewarding. Do the hat, be patient, <laughs> ask a lot of questions and work hard. <laughs> Well, I'll go next. So I think, like I said, just trying to, you know, wrap up paperwork on the real champions end of the year. And I think my two major things are, you know, just starting where your community is at, right? That was where my whole conversation started was, you know, you can't expect your community to do this if we're not on that level yet, you know, and it doesn't mean you can't work towards it, but just um, starting where your community is at and, not expecting it to be starting somewhere else. And then I think also, um, and, and I think it's probably a version of this everywhere, but I do think in rural communities, just getting to this culture of yes, not this culture of no, we can't do that. No, we can't do that. And, this, and then again, it's not this culture of yes, but, you know, it's this yes, and let's also do this. Just this culture of let's try it. You know, if it's not going to hurt anything, let's try. Um, so those are are my two, um, you know, it's not just specific to housing. It's to, you know, rural mentality, you know, start where your community is and move to this culture of, yes, we can do it. Let's try it. Mm -hmm. Very, very good point. Thank you. Cheryl, last word? Um, yes. And what Lissa said is so important is starting that conversation where your community is. But the biggest thing with me is you need to continue that conversation. You've got the stakeholders involved and, you know, just because you've done something and that, that stops, you're not growing. And the whole point of this is sustainability and growth. So keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and... Um, I think there was a message. There's a, a housing conference in Southeast Kansas. Maybe um, Nancy can share that out when you share the rest of the information for this. That'll be bringing some more housing uh, resources together. It's it's such a big topic around the state. So keep that learning going. So I think we're right on time, Nancy. Very, very good. That was super. And um, this adds to our knowledge, which is considerable about um, housing. Um, I really appreciate it. Okay, so um, we have some sharing already going on. Uh, Juan, if you want to say anything about that, um, he's given a nice um, summary there. If, if there's anything else you'd like to say, Juan, about that. Uh, no, no, I think that, that's, I think the summary. Okay, yeah. very good. Okay, good. So, so check that out. And if you don't know how to save the chat, go up to the, to your little Zoom window, look, um, hover over the right hand top corner, and you can uh, save the chat um, to your own computer so that you have Juan's information and every, all the other links there. Um, thank you. And Carrie, if you would if you would make that easy for me to share the, the Southeast Kansas housing thing, I will be happy to send it in the follow-up. If uh, Juan, I'll say, send the Verizon information out in the follow-up. If there's anybody else that wants to share something that's of interest to the whole um, group, please let us know. Um, we are starting our next uh, Trail Talk Tuesday, um, November 13th excuse me, November 14th from noon to one is our second trail talk. It will be, um, it, you have to register to participate in it. Um, the link is in the chat there. Um, this, this is a series of six webinars on the second Tuesday of each month and will feature a panel of experts taking you through all aspects of, um, of building a public trail. On November the 14th, we'll be talking about how to get started. The first one was a conversation about, um, you know, I'm thinking about it. What are the people and the people, 
people and things I need to think about. And Myron, who is on this call, was one of our speakers, and we really appreciate the way that um, communities are sharing what they've learned with others. Um, K-State Research and Extension Grant workshops continue through the fall, and they will continue in 2024. Um, we have one next week. I think it's maybe very soon to being closed, um, but if it's available, you're welcome to sign up. Um, the sign up is in the in the chat, and we have an evening class. Our Kansas um, community empowerment communities wanted to know if we'd have an evening <clears throat> class for all those of you that have full-time jobs. And so um, the December class will be an evening class. And let's see, if you'd like to promote these calls and the other grant writing and um, other grant writing and trail talk calls in your social media, send an email to KSRECV. I'll put that in the chat at ksu.edu and ask for that link. And we'll email you every time we have a PNG to say to share to your own website so that you could, or your own social media so you can make other people aware. Are there any other things to share? Take a breath and let somebody else share. As I say, if we hang up and you think, oh, I wish I'd shared such and such, send it to me at that same email address and I'll add it to the follow-up. Uh, when the call is ready to be posted, it will be posted um, on that link that I gave you for, for um, Audrey Guzman. Audrey did a ton of really great call about what they had done, um, and it'll be there. All right, well, for those of you that have been on the call, you know to expect the last thing to say is, oh, the next call. Our next call is December 1st. We have three more rural champions who will share their experiences and lessons learned about child care. So thank you very much for joining us and I'll leave you with um, a thought for the day. Our thought comes from Maya Angelo. The ache for home lives in all of us, the safe place where we can go as we are and not be questioned. So thank you for joining us.